I'm going to invite our other panelists to the stage, Rebecca Chesney, the Director of Sustainability and Innovation at Guggenheimer, and Chef Mike Kadala, the Executive Chef for a Guggenheimer at Spotify. So give them a round of applause. <laughs> One of the reasons I'm excited to talk to the three of you is because you know, the food tank and even in my previous life, this food waste and, and loss were something that I looked at a lot. And, you know, it, it took a while to get that awareness, right? It took a while for people to really understand that this was an issue. And I had people, including a former boss, tell me, like, this is not, you, you shouldn't be worrying about this, Danielle. It's not a, a real problem for the environment. And, and we've gotten beyond that now, where, where people are really highly educated about food loss and food waste. And now we're getting into the action. And that's really exciting exciting for me. So can you talk about that, Paul, like what you've seen, you know, over the years? Yeah, I mean, certainly. I think, as you kind of eloquently you know, pointed out, I think the evolution has been significant. We are seeing the education um, out there. There is tools out there to really highlight um, where this waste is being generated and then solutions to what actually can, can be done about it. We've, I think you know, historically we looked at food donation pieces and we've had some of the, the speakers talk a little bit about that. Um, but it needed to be more intuitive mm. than that. That's mm -hmm. really where kind of the evolution um, has come in there. And really, I think the narrative, you know, bringing consumers on that journey, we started this program very much as a kitchen waste solution. Yeah. And it's now actually involved into a post-consumer waste piece. So then you get into portion control, you get into protein sustainability and amount of protein, portion sizes. So all these common themes that we've spoken about today actually come together very nicely yeah. in this. So what you see is it is the whole ecosystem yeah. has, a, has a point to play. It really is. I want to take a step back with you real quick because you've had a kind of a uh, you know, an interesting journey as a CEO. Can you just give us a little synopsis? Okay, the 30-second the synopsis. Um, so, born in the UK, um, worked, my first job was in a pub, that's what you do in the UK, um, <laughs> and you're in the kitchens, washing dishes, um, etc. So just was, fell in love with the kitchen. Fell in love with the kitchen brigade, fell in love with the the education, the, the companionship, the growth that you experienced in a kitchen. Um, so, you know, worked in restaurants, hotels um, in Brighton, my hometown, the UK, um, then in London a lot. Converted to the dark side of management fairly <laughs> early on in my, in my career and found this wonderful thing called corporate dining, which meant you could serve great food, um, be passionate about things that you were really keen on, sustainability, health and well-being, and ultimately still could then have yeah. a life as well, um, which, was a, which was a big factor. And so um, got into the corporate dining space, worked with a lot of the, the big corporate dining um, players, did the Athens Olympics, not participating, cooking, um, and, and things from there. And then ultimately came to the US about 13 years ago, and long story short, um, as, as part of ISS, the Danish organization, um, we, we acquired Guggenheimer back in 2017. Unfortunately for them, they got lumbered with me as part of that process um, as a COO and then eventually as the CEO um, back in 2020. Thanks for sharing all that. And I mean, you obviously corporate dining has such a big impact. You get to hang out with uh, with people like Chef Mike. I'm wondering if you can both talk about what you've learned from one another about food waste and the innovation that it takes to prevent it. And maybe you want to go first, Chef? Sure. Uh, you know, when we have great leadership who's like fully invested in this and they build teams with like brilliant minds to tackle all these projects it you know it makes our job uh easy in the kitchen mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and i always tell my team in the kitchen that like we as chefs have the easiest job we get these vacuum sealed pieces of meat in there all we have to do is trim the fat off and that yet they're still you know, too much going in the trash, right? You know, to truly respect all the farmers who raise these animals, who feed these animals every day, the butchers, everything, we need to do a better job of just, just trimming the fat. And, you know, that's what I've learned mostly over the years is chefs, cooks, whatever you want to call us, we have the easy gig. And then it's all about the farmers who put in all the, all the hard work, yeah. Yeah, it's really honoring those farmers, the animals, all of the produce. I, I'm wondering, Paul, what you've learned from Mike. 
Yeah, I think, look, what I've learned from Mike and a lot of our chefs, first of all, is the, the passion around um, the ingredients. You ever want to go for an education, go for a chef's dinner, join six chefs at dinner at any restaurant, and it's just mind-blowing, the, the level of knowledge that they have. And so the passion around it, I think, is the key piece. We did a, a bit of a corporate mandate to say, okay, we're going to halve food waste. Well, that's... Yes, words on, on a page without the passion um, of the team. And then, of course, all the best ideas come from the kitchen. So what we did is we took the data you know, that we, we gathered through here and pushed it back to the kitchen and said, so now what? Yeah. And that's then when you get the creativity, and perhaps you want to talk a little bit about kind of what you did there in some real you know, action that yeah, just makes a difference. Yeah, exactly. So it's like we have these beautiful resources, beautiful systems, and but... It's about what to do with it before it gets into yeah. the system, into the window system, before it gets weighed. What could we do with stems of kale or what could we do with extra bread? It's creating that ecosystem in your kitchen, right? So that nothing goes to waste. That's that's the goal. And you know, we would constantly have extra bread laying around. And we're like, what do we do with it? We can make croutons, we can make breadcrumbs, but let's make something more. And so we decided to make, um, you know, Italian strata, which is the egg casserole with, you know, chunks of bread in it. And they became so popular that we had to buy more bread to get them in. <laughs> so, you know, it's just those little wins. And it all, like, you spoke about, you asked earlier, like, what could we do? What are solutions that could help right now? Yeah. And it's on the ground floor in the kitchens getting your team engaged, uh, staying dedicated, taking the same amount of thought that goes into a beautiful dish that you're going to hand your guest into that same thought, into what are you going to do with the waste? So That's why chefs are such great advocates, especially on the food loss and food waste issue. Thank you, chef, yeah. for, for doing all that. Rebecca, if I can turn to you, we, you know, people like me often talk about how bad big companies are, but there are real advantages uh, when it comes to, to reducing food waste on a big company's part. Can you talk a little bit about that? And by the way, Rebecca is also a food anthropologist, and I love anthropologists, so <laughs> I'm so glad she's yeah, here. Yes, so I was one of the people completely nerding out that I was on the stage after Marion Nessel, which when I was in food <laughs> studies, that would have never <laughs> crossed my mind. <laughs> well, and maybe I can answer this question a little bit from an anthropological perspective, um, which is if I think about sustainability and food loss and waste in a corporate food environment, that actually means that we've got the intersection of three different cultures that are all changing. So I'm looking for where can we find overlaps in how these cultures are changing yeah. to make progress. So we've got food culture, which we've heard a lot about today. Dietary shifts, younger people getting more interested, um, kind of this focus on the intersection of food and climate. So food culture is changing. We also have the changing culinary culture. And we've got James Beard Foundation here, and it's no surprise to anyone who's followed the news that the culinary world is shifting, both in terms of um, how uh, culinary job, what, what culinary jobs can look like. Right. Uh, Paul got into corporate dining because he wanted weekends. Mm -hmm. um, but also, um, you know, if I think about how that intersects with changes in, in food culture, what a lot of times you hear about in dietary shifts is how do we really look at a pretty deep-seated hierarchical system that is the kitchen and make it so that the meat station is no longer the pinnacle? How do we, how do we focus on vegetables and other things? And so I look at that as an opportunity. Then we have work culture. Um, the role of the office has changed. So what brings people into the office and what is the role of food at work? And maybe I have an idea, maybe, that having sustainable food at your workplace is one way in which employees can feel some sense of purpose at work. So that's where I think because companies are so big, yeah. um, we are able to have a scale in which we can engage with all of these different parts of an interconnected ecosystem. In my previous life, I have consulted with a lot of retailers and CPGs, and I was so excited to, to join food service because I'm sitting next to two chefs. And the thing that chefs have is creativity that can be deployed in a different way. Because mm. CPGs, which we've heard here, CPGs need consistency. because, And so do a lot of you know, fast food and quick service restaurants. Because if you go to that restaurant in one part of the country and another part of the country, you want that product to taste the same. Our chefs don't have to do that. So this is, to me, that's an also sort of an untapped yeah. uh, thing we can leverage, which is the role of creativity in chefs to be able to not just reuse foods and in, 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 you know, to avoid waste, 
but we're talking also a lot about other sustainability challenges, diversifying our diets, diversifying what we grow on farms. Um, I loved, I think it was Paul Lightfoot from Patagonia mm -hmm. talked about Patagonia being a demand anchor. Chefs are a great demand anchor because they're so creative that the anchor can actually move <laughs> um, and kind of help bring people into diversifying their diets as well. And I'm wondering if you see other industry uh, leaders in the space collaborating. Because, you know, we don't want food loss and food waste prevention to be a competitive issue. We want people to work together and collaborate. Do you see that? Yes. Um, and we actually joined the U.S. Food Waste Pact just for this reason. Um, Pre-competitive collaboration is very important. Um, and it's something that I've done in a few different ways in my career. Um, and what gets me excited about something like pre-competitive collaboration, we're talking about systemic shifts. Um, so we've, we've heard some people talking about farmers and how to support farmers. Um, and you know, Chef Mike here wants to respect the farmer. Well, if you look at refed data on food loss and waste, about a third of the food waste in the US happens at the farm and manufacturing level. Um, and then if you actually look at some of the studies, so I mentioned the Food Waste uh, Pact. The Food Waste Collaborative has done research with farmers, and they did research with strawberry farmers. You can find this case study on their website. And 36% of strawberries were left in the field. And every time you hear this, it's sort of like what we did with Winnow, capturing food waste data. Once you capture the data, you're like, wow, that's actually more than we thought, or it's in places that we didn't expect, so what do we do? And we're starting to see that happen on farms. Um, you know, WWF just released a food loss calculator for farms. So I suspect in coming years, we're gonna get more and more data about the food that farmers are growing. Yeah. Those are nutrients um, that required water and labor and money to grow. And so um, we can start to see more and more of, okay, now that we know what the nature of the problem is, how do we address it? And I would argue, bring in chefs because you give them anything and they can make it taste good. Yeah, they're absolutely creative. I do want to take a step back because we've been mentioning Winnow. We've been mentioning this tool. If, if Paul and, and Chef Mike can sort of describe what it looks like in, in the kitchen, that would be really helpful, I think, to folks watching. Yeah, so Winnow is this amazing piece of equipment. And um, it's in our kitchen, it's a scale. And it has a camera and a little screen on it. So when someone comes and dumps something into the bucket, it takes a picture of it, recognize what it is, and then on the screen, it'll show how much it weighs, how much money you've wasted. And then it all goes into a, a platform where you can look at all the statistics and see what numbers or what foods aren't working, what foods are being wasted or put into the bin. So you could then craft your menu around this information. You know, last week we had a lot of stewed beans left over, literally. And I love them, but there was a lot left over. And I'm like, hmm, how do we change this so they're not left over? Right. And Winnow gives us all that data to make our menus uh, more sustainable. Absolutely, yeah. Paul. Yeah, and I think just to add, yeah, the, the data side of it as well, I think there's the usability in the kitchen and the real real time mm -hmm. aspect. Is there a concern with this dish? Is that why we're seeing waste? You know, is it just unpopular? But then when you look at it from a cumulative you know, piece, we can actually look at you know, 400 plus restaurants across the country and say, what are we wasting? Yeah. And then from there you say, so what do we do about carrot tops? What do we do about salmon skin, right? What can we do with this? And so I think it was the um, Shake Shack saying, okay, we looked at our biggest impact, you know, burgers and milk, understood, uh, or beef and milk. Like similar effect, looking yeah. at our biggest waste opportunities to say, okay, how can we get creative? Chefs, how do we get creative to utilize this yeah. waste product right. in a better way? And then if we can't use it as a, as a food product, what can we do in a circular style to actually then, you know, compost, et cetera, or get those nutrients back into the system? Yeah, so. yeah. And one thing I like about this is that it's not meant to shame chefs in any way. It's just meant to give you more information to be more creative. And, you know, you've talked about the, the bread story and the strata. What other sort of anecdotes can you share about, like, what, what, how this tool has made you more creative? Well, you know, it... Here, I was with my mom this weekend, and of course we're cooking together, right? And so I'm thinking about this talk right now. I'm thinking about, you know, waste, and I'm cutting scallions. And I trim off the little dead ends, and I'm like, oh, mom, we're going to make a dead end pesto with the, you know, the dead ends of the scallions and all that. And so it just gets you in the creative mind of what to do. But she was like, oh, I never trim the ends of the scallion. And I'm like... <laughs> 
It made me rethink <laughs> everything I learned, and I was like, um, maybe you should just be up here talking about. Okay. Clearly, it just, clearly. It opens up your mind. You see it, you see, like, when you go onto the Winnow site and you see all these pictures of this, that, and then, and it's like, you, you start putting more thought into everything. And that's the biggest thing. It, it opens up your mind to get more creative, to do more things, to educate your, your team about what's being wasted, how much money's being wasted, and you know that money could potentially be a salary for somebody. And that's when it hits yeah. you know, everyone, right? Yeah, that's really it. Yeah. You, Rebecca, well, there's, I was gonna share kind of two things that are on the kind of the newer side of our food waste tracking. One is that um, in some of our locations, we've integrated this kind of back of house kitchen data with our menu management system. And what that allows us to do is actually see, okay, this is not you know just a tray of vegetables that we produce too much. It's actually this specific menu item that was on the menu that day. And that level of granularity has mm -hmm. really helped. So in the, in the sites that had that integration, they were able to reduce the back of house waste um, by about half. And the sites that didn't have the integration reduced their waste by um, around a little over a third, which is still great but you can see how having more granular data helps. So one of the things we're really excited about is, and you hear it, you know, I've been living in the Bay Area for a long time, you always hear it with innovation, <laughs> is data, 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 but then data has to be useful. And we're starting to look at how we can have these sort of integrations and APIs and um, really make that kind of digitalization and, and a data uh, forward um, look at our ecosystem um, be possible, and that's including, you know, how do we connect food loss and waste data with menu data, with purchasing data, with emissions data, and that's yeah far out, it's but so we want, but we're working on it. The other piece that we're starting to do um, in several locations as well is to use um, Winnow and other kind of plate waste or track, waste tracking systems to track plate waste. So sort of looking at, you know, moving that scale into an eater facing space and having people actually scrape their own plates. And again, you learn different things. We're seeing things like um, contamination of people putting napkins and to-go boxes in with the food, which is, so we're learning about things that are kind of bigger challenges for those offices and how waste streams get managed and yeah. just different things like that. So we're starting as, you know, the, the data helped us reach that 50% goal, um, achieve that and overachieve it. Right. But now we have other data that we're starting to collect, which is now it's like, what do we do with that? And it's so useful. It's common sense. It's practical. It helps chefs like Mike. Um, one of the things when we were, when we were talking earlier, preparing for this panel that really struck me is that the skills that, that Mike and other chefs are learning from the tool, that will carry them through other jobs in their careers. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that, because I think it's it's a, it's not a new skill for chefs to prevent food waste, but this helps them do it better and manage money better. Yeah, and if you could reduce your kitchen's waste by 50%, that's a big you know selling point to your next job opportunity. Yeah. But it's also you know not only about the chef, it's about the, the chefs and cooks underneath you, who yep. could, they could take that and go everywhere. So it's not just about me, it's about the whole team, what I could educate my crew about and educate our guests about too. The mentorship, I love yeah. that. Before we end, I, I wanna get some advice for you know the home cooks that are watching and other chefs who are watching. What is the one thing you would all wanna leave them with? So, Paul. That's a tough one, a couple of things. You can, you can say more than one. Okay, thanks. Um, so look, I think we've, we've talked a lot about education um, and Chef Mike there talked about kind of the chefs in the kitchen. The education side of this, passing this on, I think is huge. Um, we talked about schools, um, kind of my, my children's school has just launched a nutritional lab that I'm supporting and, and bringing in food waste management tools that they can use. So starting at the grassroots, grassroots level, um, but then really working with the kitchens as well because that brigade is designed yeah. for education right yeah. that is a how that is how kitchen brigades are built so utilize that um, i think the other piece is sticking to the food waste side of it count the amount of i'd say bins but trash cans mm. um, in your kitchen kitchens aren't small in our world in the corporate dining space they're they're as big as this room you have multiple trash cans. You have all these receptacles where you're collecting all of this waste. It's really hard to know what's going in there if you don't have a system to be able to manage that or to be looking at that. So really think about just what is going in these multiple receptacles. Yeah, great so. advice. Chef Mike. I would just 
the same way I challenge my my kitchen team is just go through your walk-ins, go through your fridges, see what's there, and just put that same thought, like I mentioned before, the same thought that you would go into your roast chicken that you're going to have for dinner tonight, put the same thought into what are you going to do with the leftovers from that roast chicken. Thank you. Fantastic. Rebecca, last word. So um, for chefs or people working in restaurants, one thing to do or two things to do. One is to look upstream um, and familiarize yourself with with farmers that you might be working with already. Maybe ask them what are you growing that no one's buying um, and help really try to reduce that food loss that happens upstream. Look for products that are upcycled that you could purchase and use in your kitchen. Um, and then also look downstream. So familiarize yourself with the EPA food recovery, uh, food waste hierarchy. Uh, actually, now it's a scale. It's no longer a hierarchy. <laughs> Um, and uh, and look at how can we uh, make sure that any waste from our kitchens and our restaurants and our operations are going into animal feed. We have some locations that have created restaurant uh, or sorry farm partnerships, animal feed, compost. Again, getting back to voting. If your city doesn't have composting, how can you help change that? That will support not just the impact of your restaurant and your operation, but all of the households and all the businesses in your community. Um, and then for anyone, whether or not you work in a restaurant or food operation, um, one of the greatest examples I've seen that seems obvious until you look at it, of why voting matters, when the Rockefeller Foundation um, published their True Cost of Food report a few years ago, it was hidden in an appendix, which of course I read because I'm a researcher. And there's a map of uh, who makes decisions in the food system and who bears the impact, including future generations. Mm -hmm. And I will challenge you to look at how many times those things match up. So the people who are making decisions are not the ones bearing the burden, including future generations. And so really look at that. That helps bring home why if you are in a position where you can make decisions, we make decisions on behalf of eaters and that influence farmers all the time. It's a huge responsibility. Uh, but also think about who are you putting into place to make decisions on your behalf and whose interests do they have. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks to all of the panelists. Congratulations again. Amazing work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.